Okay, so I'm pretty fired up about this one. Don't take this the wrong way, musicians, but after nearly 20 years of renting lockups in Brooklyn, I've come up with a mantra that's part ironic, part sincere, and I include myself in this as well. Musicians are the worst. I love being a musician in NYC, but like any roommate arrangement, my shared practice space arrangements in NYC have been a slow burn love-hate relationship. My most annoying musician experiences and how to avoid being that guy next. Here's the first guy you don't want to be. The Johnny Come Lately. Real life experience. Actually, the experience that triggered this lesson. It had been a long Thursday. I just shipped a ton of work. It was around 4.20. I was ready to get in the shed and forget all my troubles and blow off some steam. I practiced from like four to six every day at my practice spot. And for months on end, there's no one competing for that time. There are bands that have regular spots in the evenings, but nobody in my slot. Just to be safe, I checked the calendar before showing up to the shed. There he is with a three hour block right in the middle of my usual time. Johnny come lately. He signs out the room three times a year and it's always at the most inconvenient time. This has happened, well, three to four times this year. This last time I was just trying to practice, but occasionally it happens when I need to film. The most annoying thing about Johnny is in order to prevent the three in 365 chance that he might sign out a room, you need to block out every conceivable slot that he might sign out. Likely non-New Yorker question number one. Because viewers not in a major city, heck, not in New York, London, or Tokyo, probably have some questions. Like, why not just practice at home? After all, the ability to just practice anytime without worrying about anybody else in the space, let alone the ability to prevent many of the annoying things I'll talk about later on, would seem to dictate just building a home studio. Also, not to put too fine a point on it, but you may have noticed that compared to other drum YouTubers, my environments are a little more, shall we say, ad hoc. The answer is simple. In cities like New York, London, and Tokyo, getting your own house is uber expensive. Like Brownstones and Carroll Gardens where I'm standing right now start at a cool two mil. So, whether you want to rent or own, you're going to be in an apartment situation. And I tried this for years. Three issues. First, all the solutions to keeping quiet suck. If you just put towels over the heads, it's still gonna be noisy. If you use mesh heads, that's gonna interfere with your touch, especially for jazz, in which touch is paramount. Second, if you play with anything other than mesh heads, you're gonna get angry neighbors knocking on the door. The first time I tried it, it was T minus four minutes before the landlord showed up saying, oh no. The most successful time I practiced for more than four years before we finally drove this super crazy and he knocked on our door. I'm not sure to this day that he wasn't thinking about killing us there and then. I got a practice space the next day. The third reason I want to discuss later on, but let's just say there are a lot of incentives for New Yorkers to rent practice spaces that are away from their living space. Okay, annoying musician number two, the disrespect your gear guy. Now, I'm being realistic. I know I can't expect the drums to be set up exactly the way I left them. I know that if I want that, it's home studio time. But, and I suspect there are many of you who have shared a practice room who have experienced this. There are some people who, no matter what the room etiquette is, they're gonna brazenly disregard it. Typical situation. I'm running a little late and I just wanna get a tight hour in the shed. Instead, I have to spend 20 minutes treasure hunting my gear and reassembling the kit. So pieces of the kit all over the room is number one. My stick bag open and often mismatched pairs of my sticks on the kit, number two. I started marking them with a smiley face so I can track them in the wild, like humpback whales. The kit retuned in illogical ways is another. Like I'd spend 25 minutes making sure the snare is nicely in tune with itself and sounds good. And then I come back to discover somebody's marked an X across it in masking tape and detuned one lug. 
Sidebar, why do people always detune a snare drum from sounding nice so it sounds like a piece of junk? Is that like a punk rock aesthetic or something? Often, garbage all over the floor. My favorite is the little black deli bags. This is far and away the most typical type of practice roommate. My unscientific sample is there are probably five times as many of these guys as there are the considerate ones. Likely non-New York viewer question number two. And it's here that I finally get to address one of the most common questions slash complaints that I get on YouTube and Instagram. Why not just change my snare heads? But the larger question is, why not just use my own kit in the shared practice space? Two reasons. First, it's nice to have my kit in bags at the ready. Like, break in case a gig. If I have to tear it down when it's set up in the practice room and then shove it into the bags, that adds more time. Second, because either I've got to let other people play on it, and we've just talked about the ways that other people disrespect your equipment, or it's got to be one of those drum graveyards where everybody's got their own kit set up and there's just a ton of wasted space. Trust me, better to have one shared house kit you didn't spend any money on. Besides, in New York, Getting a great sound out of a $200 house kit that's seen better days is kind of a tradition. Want to bring your own kit everywhere? Fine. Try schlepping your own kit to a gig on the subway and upstairs. See how many times you want to do that again. Pretty soon, you're going to be appreciating that 1990s Tama rock kit on a jazz gig and taking a kind of absurd pride in it. In fact, here's Marcus Gilmore doing just that. Okay, annoying musician number three. Mussolini. I've sublet from a number of different landlord types, and by landlord I really just mean the primary tenant of the music practice room who's paying the facility money and then subletting it to other musicians. In spite of the perverse incentive to pack the space with tons of musicians and bands so that the landlords can save on the rent and maybe even earn a profit while the musicians fight over scraps, most landlords I've rented from have been pretty cool. And I'd rather have the slightly laid back, mildly negligent type than the alternative. Because I had one landlord who, I swear, had informants in the neighborhood. No, you didn't just hear me wrong. I just played a session with a friend and the two of us were grabbing a drink at a bar nearby, and he was asking me my opinion to the space and I was giving him some candid opinions. It hadn't occurred to me that I might need to be careful that the bartender was listening to us. But when I got home, I saw a group email to everybody who was renting the room. Somebody's just informed me that one of you was talking shit. Yup, he had an informant. And with no sense of irony or embarrassment, he went 1984 on us. I moved out the next month. I'd lived through whiplash situations in college when graduation was on the line. I wasn't about to take shit from a practice room landlord. Likely non-New York musician question number three. How hard is it to find a good practice situation in New York? And why would people stay in non-optimal situations? Why not just move? It's one thing that was on my mind when I witnessed the Stockholm Syndrome that unfurled in the wake of Mussolini's group email, when not a single person called out this paranoid, inappropriate behavior for what it was. But everybody rushed to assure the guy it wasn't they who gossiped. If I haven't mentioned it yet, it was me. And I'd do it again. And if you're paranoid about people talking about you, that's a you problem, not a me problem. Sorry for that quick digression. But the answer is, it's reasonably hard to find a nice spot. Before Mussolini's room, I was renting in a smaller, crappier spot. Then I did a session in Mussolini's big, beautiful room and I was asking my friend, how do I get in on this? And that's the answer to the second question. You can find practice spots on Craigslist, but the way easier way to get good ones is word of mouth. That's how I had a soft place to fall after I left Mussolini's room. And another after the landlord of the next room I moved into kicked me out after just a year in favor of a band who was gonna pay more money and take up less time. In summary, the disrespect your time guy, the disrespect your personal possessions guy, and the disrespect your personal sovereignty guy. There are other minor pet peeves like the add everybody from the group email to your gig list guy, and the way too precious about his gear guy. Yes, it does cut both ways. Guys, it's come to my attention that somebody left the guitar amp plugged in. Whose suitcase is this? If it's not out of here by Friday, I'll have it destroyed! Bro, 
My symbol stand log was rotated 15 degrees to the right. He always faces north! But I think those big three cover most categories. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this look at the light and dark sides of sharing space with other musicians in New York. Any wacky practice room experiences of your own? I'd love to hear about them in the comments. See you next time.